In this video, we're going to discuss Keynes's general theory. In macroeconomics, there are three broad schools of thought. There's the classical school of thought, the Keynesian school, and the monetarist school. These are three approaches that economists use to look at macroeconomics and macroeconomic problems. The, the classical school of thought looked at the economy as being self-regulating and always tending towards equilibrium and full employment. In the classical school of thought, the idea was that macroeconomic problems and phenomena could be described in the same way that we explain microeconomics uh, problems and phenomena. The, the tools and the economics would really be all the same. So when we looked at macroeconomics, we looked at competition and the market process and prices and profits as the way to explain macroeconomic uh, phenomena. And in fact, if there are ups and downs in the economy, maybe because of business cycle fluctuations, well, that was okay. That was kind of the way a normal, healthy, functioning economy worked. Maybe technology um, would be changing rapidly more rapidly or less rapidly at a given point in time. And that would be reflected in kind of a boom or bust or boom or recession in the economy. And again, that was all part of the normal, healthy functioning of an economy. And that's kind of the way economists approached uh, macroeconomics and macroeconomic problems um, uh, for, for a long time, and certainly before Keynes. The monetarist school of thought when it comes to macroeconomics is basically you know, sh shares the idea that the economy would be self-regulating and efficient and tend towards equilibrium and tend towards full employment as long as the monetary policy was correct, as long as the monetary policy was not erratic. And that essentially the idea was that you had to keep the pace of uh, money growth, the amount of money that was in the economy had to be kept steady and proportional to the growth of the economy and the growth of the output in the economy. So as long as you had the monetary policy correct, then the, your, your macroeconomics uh, would also be correct. And then the third broad category is the Keynesian school. Um, now, the Keynesian idea was that Markets and competitive processes generally worked, but if we left the economy alone, they would rarely operate at full employment. So there needed to be some active uh, help from the government in terms of fiscal policy in order to maintain full employment. Now, in Keynes's system, the, the, the problems arose because the uh, economy could experience insufficient aggregate demand. There wouldn't be enough demand in the economy and therefore you'd have unemployment, you'd have underinvestment, you'd have reduced output. So in Keynes's world, uh, the government, the only way for the um, uh, for this to be corrected was for the government to increase spending as a way of increasing aggregate demand. John Maynard Keynes was an English economist who lived from 1883 to 1946. And his most important work was the General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, which he published in 1936 in the middle of the Great Depression. It's oftentimes just called the General Theory because the title is so long. Now, Keynes uh, wrote this book in the middle of the Great Depression, and the question at, at that time, um, you had unemployment that was 20 25, 30%, and it persisted for some time. So the question economists had was, why was, um, uh, you know, why was this problem persisting for so long? And that's the answer, that, that was the question that Keynes was trying to answer when he wrote the general theory. The general theory is written in terms of, of, of trying to understand the problem of unemployment. And um, unemployment is at the center of the general theory. And one of the things we have to remember is at this time, you know, the social safety net that we're familiar with today didn't really exist. There wasn't unemployment insurance. There wasn't um, uh, social security and other assistance programs the way there are today. So when someone was unemployed, it was, it was in, in some sense, uh, worse than it was today because there was no, there was no uh, assistance programs. So 
let's look at the Keynesian system. The Keynesian system, first and foremost, is a system of aggregates. We have aggregate supply, um, which is really the total supply of all goods and services in the economy. So we can add up the supply of all pizza and all sodas and all legal services and all movies and all painting and just really everything gets supplied in the economy. If we add up all that supply, we would wind up with aggregate supply. Now, conversely, there's an aggregate demand, the total demand for all goods and services in the economy. If we add up the demand for automobiles and bicycles and movies and um, Chinese food and just on and on and on. If we added up all the uh, demand in the economy, we wind up with aggregate demand. And um, since there was an aggregate supply and an aggregate demand, there was also a general equilibrium. This is a case where aggregate supply and aggregate demand were equal. They were balanced. That The total demand in the economy was balanced against the total demand uh, of the total supply in the economy. When we're in general equilibrium, we would the employment level would also be equal to full employment, meaning that there would be no cyclical unemployment in the system. There would only be frictional and structural unemployment. So the employment level will be at full employment. And then lastly, uh, the real GDP, the GDP we experience in the economy, would be equal to the potential GDP. We'd be at full capacity. There would be no excess capacity. Um, uh, in, in the economy when we're in general equilibrium. Now, in this system, um, un, you know, what Keynes was concerned about was the fact that unemployment could exist uh, in the system at less than full employment. And even in a case where maybe you had an equilibrium in the labor market, you could still have less than full employment. Uh, and then with regards to inflation, um, there was – Inflation was only something that had to be worried about. Inflation was only something that could happen when we reached full employment. If we were at less than full employment, we didn't have to worry about inflation. So let's go in to some more detail about Keynes' system. And we're going to, this kind of aligns with the chapters in the general theory. Uh, and the major points that Keynes made in, in each one of the chapters. And in, in the general theory, he kind of builds an argument for what the system is and why it is the way it is and what the answers are. So the first one that Keynes talked about was, was again, he was trying to solve the problem of unemployment. So he had to put employment uh, front and center into the system. So that's what he does in, 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 in the beginning. He says that, well, the national income that we have, depends upon the amount of employment. When employment increases, we have more income. There's a direct relationship between the amount of employment that we have and the amount of income we have. Now, when employment increases, that means that people's incomes will increase. More people working, they're making more. Well, there would be a, a, a rise in consumption. But Keynes suggested and Keynes stated this was a fundamental part of his system was that consumption that would, re that would result from incremental income that resulted from incremental employment would be less than the rise in income. So the marginal propensity to consume when we get new income was less than one. When consumers get new income, they spend some of it and they save some of it. They don't spend all the incremental income that they get. And we also know that um, employment would not come just from the demand that results from consumption, but also the demand that comes from investments. So if somebody is going to expand their business, they're going to build a new factory or a new building. Well, that's another way that people can be employed. Somebody has to design the building and deliver the materials and then put them together and then people work at the building. So employment results not only from consumption, but also from investment. But Businesses who are making investments, they know the first thing Keynes told us was that the marginal propensity to consume was less than one. That when um, when when people got additional income, they wouldn't spend it all. So as a result, businesses didn't invest all that they could. They invested less than 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 they could. 
uh, the current investments were less than the amount of loanable funds that were available because they were anticipating there being less consumption than consumers could could could, could make. Consumers would not spend all of the uh, income and the incremental income they received. They would save some of it. So businesses, as a result, would scale back their um, operations. They'd scale back the uh, their investments. And so the amount of investments that were made were less than the loanable funds that would be available. So the system would come to rest in equilibrium with some excess capacity. Consumption would be less than income because the marginal propensity to consume was less than one. Investment would be less than savings because businesses didn't want to invest all they could knowing that con consumers were not going to consume all they could. And so this, as a result, the employment uh, level that we saw would be less than full employment. All of this was because of an insufficiency of effective demand. When people aren't demanding as much as, consuming as much as they could, when they're not investing as much as they could, there's an insufficiency of effective demand. And as a result, we would see employment that was greater uh, or, or less than rather full employment. And this was true even though unemployed people wanted to work. Um, People wanted to work and they wouldn't get hired. And, 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 and so this was a problem, this problem of unemployment or employment less than full employment. Now, part, how was it that people wanted to work but weren't able to find work? Well, the answer for Keynes was sticky wages, and this was an important part of his system. Sticky wages said the following, employment could increase if workers were willing to accept lower wages. If they're making $10 in the past, now they're unemployed. If they would accept nine or eight, um, then maybe they could get a, a, get a job. But he, 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 he said that emp employees won't do that. They won't accept lower wages. They won't accept lower nominal wages. Um, because they wanted to make what they were making before. Now, I might you, you know, Keynes argues this in the book, but he doesn't really provide any evidence for this other than just kind of the common sense, you know, you know, part of this. But there's certainly no data or evidence or studies or that kind of thing. It's just something that he posits and that we have to, have to accept. And much of the general theory is, is, is like this, is written like this. Um, so he says that workers will not accept lower nominal wages. But they will, they, they, they can be fooled. They will accept low, you know, less purchasing power. So we could have flexible money and, and, and maybe you could have, um, uh, you know, inflation and less purchasing power and workers would take that, but they wouldn't take flexible wages. But from Keynes' standpoint, it didn't really matter. Flexible wages or flexible money it was the same thing. You could achieve the same result. So get, if, you, if you kept the wages the same, but the wages were able to, to purchase less, there was less purchasing power, then the workers would be fooled. They'd go back to work for the same wages with less purchasing power, and the businesses didn't care because they were paying lower real wages, which in, in sense ma matter not so much the, the the nominal wages. So this is what Keynes is 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 is, is trying to to deal with here is the fact that one of the ways that the market could, could resolve the problem is with lower wages. And Keynes was saying, well, no, the market really can't do that. The, 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 the labor market could be broken because of sticky wages and the, and the employers and the employees wouldn't come together and, and expand employment because of this, because of this, this phenomenon, the sticky wages problem. And so we have unemployment. The employment level is less than full employment. And so that's a problem. And in the Great Depression, it was in 20, 25%. And, and Keynes was trying to explain that. So you know, what was the solution? Well, the solution to, to increase employment and to achieve full employment was to spend more. Spending had to be increased. There had to be more demand for businesses to want to hire people. And and that had that demand would have to come from, from spending. Now, it, it, spending could come from consumption or investment or from government. And it, from an from an economic standpoint, it didn't matter where it came from. It just had to be more. One of those or all three of those had to go up. And it's an important point, Keynes, that all spending is the same. Consumption spending and investment spending and government spending, they're all the same. 
and they're all equal in with regards to increasing demand and increasing employment. But he's already stated that consumer spending is less than it could be and it's stuck. And business investment is less than it could be and it's also stuck. So that only leaves government spending. So the government had to increase spending to restore the missing demand, to increase aggregate demand and to restore full employment. If you wanted to have more people working, the only way you could do this was with through government spending, through fiscal policy. Now, it's an important part of Keynes' system, and it is the fact that all spending is also subject to a multiplier. So if the government spends an additional dollar, um, let's say they contract and you know for some to have some bridges built and they pay a dollar. I mean, it'd be more than that, obviously, but let's just use a dollar because it's simpler. If the government spends a, a dollar, they pay that to the people who build the bridge. But the people who build the bridge, when they get that dollar, they don't spend all of it. They spend some and they save some. In this case, let's assume the marginal propensity to consume is 75%. Well, they'd spend 75 cents and they'd save 25 cents. The third person who, the person who built the bridge, the person who built the bridge would spend the 75 per, uh, cents with a third person. That third person would spend 75% of that with a fourth person, 56 cents. And if you add up the original dollar plus the 75%, 75 cents plus the 56 cents, and you keep going and going and going until it goes to zero, um, as it works, that one original dollar works its way through the economy. The original dollar after the multiplier is the same as spending $2.93 of incremental spending. The original, if you want to spend, uh, uh, if you want to add $2.93 into the economy and the marginal propensity to consume is 0.75, then you only have to add a dollar because as a dollar works its way through the economy, the incremental spending will equal $2.93. So the point here is that we have to realize that all spending is subject to a multiplier. And if we want to add money to the economy, we don't add the amount we want to add. We add something less because the multiplier, as it works its way through economy, will wind up you know, adding more. And this is an important um, idea in Keynes' system and, and macroeconomics, that we have this idea of multipliers as, as the dollars that get added work their way through the system. It works in reverse also. If you take a dollar out of the economy, it will then be, if you take one dollar out of the economy, well, that one dollar doesn't go to somebody and then it just works its way through and, and, you, and you'd wind up subtracting actually more than the dollar, you'd, in this case, $2.93, um, you know, from the, from the economy. So all subject, all spending is subject to a multiplier. Now, the government can, if they're going to increase spending as a way of increasing demand and increasing employment, they can keep doing that without worrying about inflation as long as they're below full employment. But once they reach full employment, then any incremental spending on top of that will result in inflation. So they don't have to worry about inflation until they reach full employment. Once they reach full employment, additional incremental spending will result in inflation. And so um, once full employment's reached, they have to stop the government spending because if they don't stop the government spending, then they will, they will, they will create inflation. Now Keynes, you know, uh, went back in, in, in chapter 12 and basically said that, remember, private laissez-faire investment cannot be relied upon to produce the necessary investments to maintain full employment because they would, for all the reasons we talked about, marginal propensity to consume and being less than one, that the um, uh, amount of investment that happens being less than the available loanable funds, uh, the insufficiency of aggregate demand, the fact that businesses know that, you know, all, all of that will result in not enough spending, in not enough investment in the private system. And so, in, in a sense, Keynes is doubling back around just to remind people that we can't just leave um, the private economy uh, to, to, to do this. They won't invest enough and that you won't reach full employment if we just have the private economy uh, and private investors um, uh, doing all the, as, as the only ones doing investments. And Although monetary policy was an important part of macroeconomics, monetary policy alone could not be relied upon 
we couldn't use interest rates alone to regulate all the investments that would be necessary to achieve full employment. So monetary policy by itself in Keynes' system is not an answer. And, you know, ultimately Keynes argued that direct central control of long-term investments by the state, by the government, would be necessary to ensure full employment. That really full employment, um, uh, if you wanted to have it over the long term, that you had to have the government manage investments because only the government could do it in a way um, that would be that that would provide investments necessary to provide full employment. And again, this was Keynes's. You know, a fundamental part of Keynes' system, as we argued in his book, um, and uh, you know, this is this is one of the conclusions that, that he came to. He's, the book is not a book that has, or and his system is not one where it, it basically has, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, proof of this or 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 really any of this. It's just really a set of logical ideas to explain uh, the situation that produced less than less than full employment, and so. Again, if we look at the conventional wisdom in economics, we basically say that if you have unemployment, that's because wages are too high. The wages have to come down in order to balance uh, supply and demand in the labor market. And so if you wanted to have the, an adjustment and have and have more employment, you had to have lower wages. What Keynes basically said is that be, that's not true. That won't work. That won't result in full employment because of sticky wages. The labor market can be kind of stuck in the situation where you have more supply than demand, where you have uh, unemployment that could be very high, where you have um, employment that's less than full employment. And of course, you could also have savings, in private savings, private investment rather, would be less than savings. So the labor market and the investment market um, uh, could be in, in a private market, in a competitive market without intervention, without the government being involved, could be not enough. And then you could have high unemployment, and then you would have uh, unemployment or employment that was less than full employment. And all of this was the result of the fact that there is not only a microeconomy, but a macroeconomy, another level, where you had not only you, you had aggregate supply and aggregate demand that had to also be in balance. You could have insufficient aggregate demand, you could have aggregate demand and aggregate supply out of balance, uh, and and as a result, have an economy where unemployment was high and the employment level was less than full employment. So in Keynes' system, there's this macroeconomic system and set of dynamics that exists um, in a sense above the microeconomic uh, set of dynamics. That, that there were two levels uh, to the economy, a micro level where you had the individual markets for goods and labor investments, and then a macroeconomic level where you had aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And um, you could have balance or equilibrium in one without balance in the other, and that could result in, 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 in problems. And the only way to really reconcile this was through uh, the government, you know, active uh, intervention into the markets. The government had to uh, spend more and use fiscal policy as a way of keeping aggregate demand and aggregate supply in balance and to keep employment at full employment. So if we look at this system, I mean, the important you know point of, of Keynes is that markets can fail at an aggregate level. Aggregate supply and aggregate demand can be out of balance and this can sustain itself uh, unless the government intervenes in the market and create and makes up for the missing demand, makes up for the insufficient aggregate demand with fiscal policy and government spending. Now, we have to um, also, you know, realize that some of the implications of Keynes's system. So one of them is that you know the idea that uh, you know spending can create income for Keynes. Uh, income was a function of consumption. And so the more it consumed, in, in a sense, the more it consumed, the more demand it created, the more employment it created, the more output it created. And, and, and in a strange way, you know, Keynes suggests that, 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 that income is a function of consumption, that we could just consume more if we wanted more income, which is 
um, you, you know, it, it's it, it, it's certainly the opposite of the traditional or conventional wisdom that said that basically um, that consumption was a function of income. We had to produce the goods and services first, and then we could consume them. So there are some issues with the causal relationships. I think Keynes, um, you know, this is one of the major problems of Keynes' system. It just suggests that the causal relationship is such that consumption can create income. And I, I, I think that's, that's a, that's a hard, um, you know, for many economists to, to kind of accept. That's one of the implications of Keynes you have to accept. And I'm, I think many economists have a hard time accepting that, but, be that as it may, Keynes is the most influential economist of the 20th century. The macroeconomics that we study today, the macroeconomics that gets practiced today, is Keynes's macroeconomics. It's the macroeconomics of Keynes's general theory. So, despite the fact that there are some, uh, um, you know, some some flaws or issues with Keynes's system, Keynes's system is the system that we use when we talk about the Federal Reserve Bank, when we talk about um, fiscal policy, when we talk about macroeconomics. We're talking about Keynes's system, the system that comes from Keynes's general theory.